like we said, we're going to talk about distributed security alerting. But first, about us. I'm Carly. I'm Gianluca, of course. And we live in Stockholm, and we're both security engineers uh, at Spotify. And we both focus on mainly cloud security or infrastructure security. And now let's dive in what, to what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to talk about the Spotify environment, because I think it's probably pretty similar to a lot of your environments. And then we're going to go into the distributed security problem. We're going to talk about Comet, which is an open source project that uh, we released. We're going to talk about metrics and the conclusion. So let's dive into the Spotify environment. So we're agile, like everyone else. Um, but that means something else for everyone. So for us, it means we're split into squads. Each squad is about 2 to 15 people, and each squad owns their own resources. Since each squad owns their own resources, they can decide what they do with those resources um, and how they operate them. They also own all the operations for those resources. We have a few golden paths, but at the end of the day, it's their decision how they do things. So this sounds great. Um, autonomous engineers can be really productive engineers. Um, but we have 132 squads currently, and we have more than 1,000 engineers. And it's been like this for about 10 years. So we've had 10 years of a few hundred squads creating their own environments. Yeah. And so now we need security everywhere. We have multiple billing accounts with AWS, Azure, and GCP. We have hundreds of websites, and they're owned by contractors, and they're owned by people we fired, and they're owned by marketing sites, and yeah. We also have a lot of these backend services. And the backend services are all like what I like to call asterisk normal backend services. So they're like mostly normal, and they mostly follow the golden path. But something went wrong once, and now before you touch it, make sure to read the docs, because that weird thing might still like, affect the behavior somehow. Um, sometimes we also have other companies' infrastructure, because sometimes we buy companies, and then their entire stack becomes part of our entire stack. And we usually buy companies at a faster rate than we can integrate their stacks into our infrastructure. So here we are. And for good measure, we have a few data centers, because we used to have all of our own data centers. And now we're trying not to do that, but it's a long tail. So as you can see, we have a distributed security problem. We have a lot of resources. It's kind of confusing, and it's hard to keep track of. And so now let's dive into how these distributed autonomous system owning teams deal with security. To do that, let's talk about security engineering at Spotify. We're a team of like 30 people. Um, and we try and keep Spotify secure at, set, at scale. We work on application security, incident response, risk management, or like us, on uh, infrastructure security. But now let's do a thought experiment, OK? Let's imagine we have 50 normal engineers for every one security engineer. And let's imagine the normal engineers all know their asterisk normal systems really, really well. And let's imagine the Security engineers all know their security system, like the security knowledge really well. Who do you think would be better at understanding the security knowledge, the security problems of these asterisk normal systems? Who thinks it would be the security engineers? Who thinks it would be the normal engineers? Yeah, well, it's both, but it's a lot of the normal engineers. It's like deep knowledge of a system really helps them understand the security problems of their systems. So we need normal engineers help. And we need the normal engineers to try and be security engineers. Um, all the normal engineers like technically own the security problems of their work, since they own everything else about their work. Um, and we help everyone with secure architecture, and we help drive security changes in the org. Um, and we help them when they need to wear their security hats. But 
Because they're around their products all the time, a lot of times we find they're in a better place to deal with the security problems um, that they're facing. So we like to say it's our job to teach them when they need to wear their security hats. So now let's look at how we can't do security considering that the most help that we can get doing our jobs is from them. Um, we can't not give them permission to do things because they're autonomous and so they'll just go behind our back. And also if we think back to the 50 engineers to one security engineer, it's not so hard to get away with something if they really wanted to. It's much better if they're talking to us. Again, we can't give them long and tedious ways to get around those permissions because, um, again, they'll just go behind our back. So it kind of boils down to telling them no is really hard because when they come to us the same way we want them to wear their security hats, they expect us to wear our product hats. So we need to think what is the business value they're trying to gain and then like how can we meet security requirements with that business value? Along those lines, uh, we can't blame them for bad security. They usually um, like made they usually made the decision based on things that we don't know about, and we also need to trust them to make the right decisions. Um, they're good engineers mostly, and so we need to believe in them. So, um, how do we do it? We can't expect them to love security because otherwise they would all join our team and they don't all want to join our team. Um, we can't imagine all of their use cases because uh, they think of some really cool but also kind of weird stuff. Um, and so since we can't think of all their use cases, we can't just hard code the rules into it and call it a day. We also need them to feel complete ownership over their stuff and so we can't take any of the important security stuff away from them even if the security stuff is like really important, like our login flow. Um, so what do we do? We like to use this bouncy castle analogy. Um, we want to provide a bouncy castle for our engineers. Um, right? If you're in a bouncy castle, you can jump extra high, you can have a lot of fun, um, you can practice front flips and back flips, and you can land on your head and not break your neck. So we want an environment where engineers can do things they'd be too scared to do other places. Um, how do we do this? Usually it's through hardening. Um, we think hardening is pretty standard. Um, it's usually more secure. It's a better base for an environment. But it breaks one of the principles of knowing everything our uh, engineers will want to do and knowing how they'll use the different parts of our infrastructure. So for that, we also use scanning. Um, in order to maintain the security uh, that we want with the conditions of our engineers doing weird stuff a lot of the times, we find scanning can sometimes be a better option. Um, so the two main reasons we might want to scan instead of harden is because um, we have a lot of stuff that seems like a bad idea but has a lot of use cases. And if we make our engineers go around us for all of those use cases, um, they just start going around us kind of no matter what um, without, our, without asking. And another thing is there's a lot of stuff that's really hard to harden against but pretty easy to scan for. For example, something that's usually a bad idea but also has a lot of use cases is this all users and all authenticated users in uh, Google Cloud Platform, or GCP. Um, it's useful if you're running a website because all users means all users on the internet and all authenticated users means all authenticated users to any Google service. Um, but it's ambiguous and a lot of our engineers were using this to mean all authenticated Spotify users. So we started scanning for it and sending out emails saying, hey, you assigned this permission, did you mean to? And it worked really well. Most people would fix it. Um, yeah. Case two is stuff that's hard to harden against. And for this, uh, we have web scanning. We can, uh, for web scanning, we use uh, Detectify. And we do this because we um, outsource our websites sometimes. A lot of the marketing teams who aren't always so technical want to build websites. Um, and we can keep track of all the websites we have um, with certificates but um, it's pretty hard to keep track of all the environments that all the marketing sites are contracting um, before they put out the websites. And so 
Scanning after the fact is pretty easy and does minimal damage since um, the websites are not always connected internally so much. But now we have the main problem that we're going to talk about, which is the security team has a lot of alerts. Um, there's a lot of open source uh, tools, and there's a lot of commercial scanners, and they're really, really good at what they do, um, mostly scanning. Um, but they're less functional for directing the alerts in the, to the right places. And so the security team ends up doing a lot, a lot of manual work. So why, what problems do we have? Um, acting on alerts is a manual process. We need to reach out by hand. Uh, we can easily lose track of who we've talked to. Basically, this doesn't scale at all. Um, it's confusing for customers because different people reach out at different times with requests that all sound a little bit similar, but they don't really understand any of them. And so they're not sure if they're talking about the same thing. Um, it's also really unclear branding from the security team. Um, and it's also super not fun for security. Uh, it's like the least fun for security. Like the security team is very upset about this because we'd rather spend our time building stuff. And as our team started to dive into this, we realized that it's a well-known problem in a lot of industries, usually called the last mile problem. Um, what is the last mile problem? It started with telecommunications uh, industry. When they were hanging wires, they realized that it was pretty easy to distribute them basically to towns. It was really hard to get it that last mile, which is like a hypothetical mile, um, to people's houses. And that's really where the speed slowed down. Um, there's um, a whole Wikipedia page on this, actually. Um, so it's a pretty common bottleneck. So we started looking at where our bottleneck was forming. Um, and we saw two main things. One is that different resource types have different um, ownership consequences. So an IAM group versus a website versus a GCP project are all going to have different like, ownership consequences in our backend. Another is that ownership is kind of a confusing, fluid concept. Like People leave, and people come in. People create things that they don't mean to put in production that end up in production. There's a lot that could go wrong. But we had a solution, because we felt like we could program something that would uh, solve this all for us. Um, for in-house made scanners, we noticed we tended to rewrite the code, finding the right owners, and cobbling together templates um, again and again to notify the correct owner. We noticed that every implementation came with its own set of bugs, and a lot of them were pretty similar. Um, we also realized these alerts were a great source of data. And the security team struggled to find good sources of data to give our stakeholders to show them like, what we were doing with our time. Um, and lastly, we realized these could be a great uh, source of teaching for the organization. If we had a way of like, finding a security problem and then explaining it in like, good wording to the people who created the problem, um, maybe they could learn stuff and not make the same mistake again. Um, also, more in the area of metrics, we realized that we could look at which parts of the company were getting alerts and figure out how they were doing on those alerts. And um, we could learn where we needed better scanning capabilities based on who was not scan getting scanned and who wasn't getting alerts. So we had something to build. We wanted a robust, scalable alert handling tool that would automate away a lot of the manual work and at the same time provide us with metrics and an overview of our infrastructure security. Yes. Can you hear me? Right. So <clears throat> we started the, by uh, abstracting away all the notification logic we, we did implement in each security controls we, we were running. Uh, when I say security controls, I mean uh, scanning tools or just anything that raises and alerts and monitors resources. Uh, we abstract away all of that and we build a single platform that is now the main pillar of our security infrastructure. The platform is called Comet, and we release that as open source. So at its core, Comet is a notification hub. It receives alerts from our security infrastructure and delivers that directly to the owners of the resource that are affected. Uh, the main goal is to remove security as a middleman. 
Uh, on top of the platform, we, we build some nice features. So everything we were doing manually before, like ownership lookup or require an acknowledgement or request people to fix their stuff, it's kind of built in right now. So we require acknowledgements. Um, the platform uh, pretend that the end user will, uh, will act on everything that he receives from, uh, from us. And um, we, by using that, we also discovered that it's a great way to educate developers in the org. So if we can send a well descriptive uh, uh, notification about a security problem, that's like the first interaction uh, a developer as with the security team, and, and that's a great opportunity for us to educate them better on how to be more responsible uh, for the stuff they operate. Um, we, we designed the whole thing uh, with a few features. Everything is extremely customizable, uh, starting with the ownership lookup. As Carly said, we have a very diverse environment, and ownership is a very hard problem for us because we didn't invest early in a proper inventorization strategy for all the assets we have. So this is one of the biggest reasons behind the whole system. Uh, it handles the duplication of alerts. Um, I think we are very aware that we don't want to trigger is alert fatigue, which is, uh, I guess, a very known concept. If you flood people with security alerts, they just get ignored. So the, the, the purpose of having the alert in the first place is defeated. Uh, we do have automated follow-up with them. And then if everything fails, if uh, the alert gets ignored, we don't see an acknowledgement, or the acknowledgement we see is an answer we don't like, uh, comment triggers an escalation for the security team. And that's where we are ping and we are manually involved in the process. On top of that, we started leveraging the platform to extract the useful, useful data and metrics. Uh, everything is customizable. Uh, every component is extendable through a plugin system. The reason is that uh, the security organization is split into teams. Every team has a focus on different areas, like many other security orgs. And uh, uh, they need the, the freedom to alter the logic of their notification. So, so everything has to be easy to customize. Uh, the design is inspired by Flask. Uh, Flask is a popular web framework. Uh, used, used to develop a web application. It's a library you just drop in and then you can just install plugins through the Python package system. Of course, Comet is written in Python. Uh, we love Python in the security org. We are really fighting to keep it as the main language, although the company is Java-oriented nowadays. Um, we do have uh, three open repositories. Uh, the first one, uh, Comet, is the main one where we provide examples and the documentation. Comet Core is the main package. It's uh, all you need to run a Comet instance. And Comet Common is a package of plugins we open source. Uh, plugins that are not uh, tied to our specific environment to support some, op some scanners and uh, that are publicly available. So let's uh, just give you an idea of the whole flow. So we do have a resource. Uh, an asset that could be a cloud account, a website, whatever. And then we have a security control operated by security. The security controls monitor the asset uh, and, or, or scan it. It tries to detect a vulnerability. Whenever a vulnerability is found, instead of firing an email to the security team as we used to, or just trying to fire an email directly to the owner somehow, we do feed the, the, the alert to a pub sub queue. PubSub is a message broker. It's uh, a Google product. We use that uh, extensively, but you can just imagine that as a message queue. So every security control now is a, is a feeder, is uh, publishing messages to a single queue. And on the other side, there is the Comet instance that is uh, consuming them. So whenever uh, an alert now is consumed from PubSub, Comet takes it and deliver and, uh, and validate it. It tries to understand if the, the alert is something that is expected. And this means, is the, it means that the, the security control that is firing the alert is something that is, uh, is being configured in Comet. So everything that we don't understand, uh, random gibberish that can be published to PubSub is discarded. 
um, the all the logic of handling uh, a specific uh, alert is handled by a plugin that defines how the message must be parsed, how it must be fingerprinted. Uh, fingerprinting is like the logic to uh, identify every single alert for the duplication purposes. Then we do hydrate it, and this means attaching metadata that we believe is useful to, to build the final notification. And the, the, the most important part is the ownership information. And then finally, there is, there is the routing part. That's where uh, we, we instruct the system on how to deliver to the final owner. Uh, and finally, when the message is routed, we, we do deliver directly to the resource owner, and we can do that by email, by Slack, by other methods. So everything is extendable, so we, we, we are very flexible. On It really depends on how the teams prefer to receive alerts. We, we, we've seen that some teams like to have everything into their email, some others, they use Jira, they want tickets there. So it's on security to be flexible. Otherwise, we cannot really pass the message that they need to prioritize security work. Uh, this is a bit uh, under the hood. Uh, uh, we have, uh, just to show you like the moving parts, uh, there is the PubSub uh, queue. Uh, incoming messages are handled by an input gateway. The input gateway uh, delivers the message to the end of logic. The end of logic is recurring. It gets the message, uh, passes it to the parsing interface where the specific security control plugin is configured. And uh, there, the message is uh, validated. The, the hydration occurs. The hydration is, in our case, mostly is finding the owner. And this means that we need to interact with different APIs. So, for example, if we get an alert for a, a cloud account that is misconfigured. We just need to like query AWS or, or Google Cloud to get the IAM policy and find the owner. But if it's a website and the website is uh, handled by a third party, we need to, to query some other resources internally to try to figure out uh, who is the actual owner of the resource. So, the addition happens, the fingerprinting happens, and then the, 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 the enrich message is saved to the local database, where it's picked up by a recurring process events, uh, cron job, kind of. Uh, it takes all the events, they duplicate them, try to understand if they need to be delivered, and if yes, it's, uh, the message is passed to the output interface and delivered to the end user. At this point, the end user gets a notification uh, you have a security problem in something you own, or at least we believe you own, and we require your acknowledgement. And the acknowledgement usually comes in, in the forms of clicking a button or just uh, like uh, giving us some, some text on an input box. And uh, the interaction is handled by uh, an exposed API from Comet. We usually ask the developers if uh, what we believe is an issue is actually a false positive, if it's uh, a legit use cases, or maybe it's just a testing and temporary. So the interaction is done through the APIs and, uh, and the flow is closed. Um, we do support two kinds of alerts. Uh, we call them batch alerts and real-time alerts. So batch alerts is everything that comes out from a recurring scan. So if there is an alert that scans daily, for example, we expect, uh, and there is a misconfiguration, we expect an alert every day, right? So those kind of alerts are digested by Comet automatically. We do have like a, a moving window mechanism to understand when to fire out a final notification to the owners, so to avoid the alert fatigue. We don't want to spam them, pretty much. So the whole logic is bundled in, and uh, all the alerts are batched and send, uh, send directly. Real-time alerts, on the other hand, comes from our uh, CM, for example. We do use Splunk internally, and we have some searches, like many of you have. And if on those searches, there are alerts configured. So if something bad happens, like you are opening up a bucket on AWS, boom, uh, an alert is fired, Comet handles that, uh, do all the hydration part and deliver directly to the owner, skipping the whole uh, digesting logic. 
So every every piece you you see in the in the image is uh, customizable. Uh, the input output interfaces, the alert logic part, the parts of the fingerprint hydration routing, and the interactive APIs. Uh, we do uh, have a package with a collection of plugins uh, that is also used as an example. It's called Comet Common. Uh, it's comprised of uh, plugins for two security controls. One is for SETI, is the GCP cloud security scanner we develop with Google. And the other one is Detectify, is the web scanner we service that we use to monitor our third party website fleet. On top of that, we do have a PubSub interface, of course, and then output interface for email and Slack. So everything is public. Uh, take a look at the repository. So how uh, complex is to operate uh, Comet? Uh, the main goal is to save time for security. We don't want to chase people around. We don't want to like uh, spend a lot of time maintaining our infra. Everything has to be a bit lightweight so we can focus on understanding the security problems, what we need to detect, where we should harden, and so on. So I, I'll, I'll just go through the quick start. We publish on the uh, slash, uh, Spotify slash comment on GitHub, uh, just to give you like uh, an understanding of how lightweight this system is. Uh, it's, as I said, everything is written in Python. The main part is uh, import comment is the main logic, and then for the sake of the example, we imported the three plugins here, PubSub interface, Detectify, and Forsetti. Um, we initialized the main instance with the configuration. It needs at least uh, a database URI. And then after that, we started registering the plugins. If you are familiar with Flask web development, it's very similar. We, we tried to mimic the whole design concept. So for inputs, we registered the, the, the PubSub uh, plugin as an input with its configuration. For parsers, as we, we registered those as, as uh, supported uh, security controls. So for SETI is labeled for SETI, Detectify is labeled Detectify. Uh, we do have this register underscore something to, to help the registration. And then we start building our core logic, and this is like specific to the instance you want to run. Uh, we use decorators for this. The first is uh, uh, the hydration part, how we do add metadata to incoming alerts. In this example, we want uh, a specific logic to be triggered every time a Forseti alert comes, uh, so it gets specific metadata. In this example, we do just uh, set the owner, uh, and then set the fingerprint. Uh, the fingerprint logic is, uh, is uh, customizable because uh, if you have a, a scanner that scans daily, like for SETI, you get in the message the timestamp and other value that change continuously. So you can't really like copy them and see if they are unique in, in a weak streak, right? So you have to configure that to, to ignore some fields and then uh, you are able to get an identifier and make the duplication properly. After that, it's about to re we need to register the router. The router in this case is not specific to a source type, uh, so it, it will trigger all alerts, and this is like uh, sending an email pretty much. We, we, we de describe how we want the email to be sent, we change the subject, we make the body and we send it out. And finally, the escalation logic. The escalation logic gets triggered by Comet whenever he thinks the security team should be involved. So something has not been acknowledged in time, or something has been acknowledged in, in, in a bad way. Um, it, it's the same, there is a, a, a decorator. We, we just write a custom function, and then uh, we, we shape how we want to get the notification and in which form. And finally, app.run and Comet is running. I believe this uh, example, which is public, in, uh, you can find that in the repository, without comments, without space, might be like, I don't know, 60 lines of code. So it's pretty lightweight, it's pretty robust, and uh, it's easy to operate. Like our operational load is vastly reduced. We can say we are kind of happy. And finally, uh, this is an example of a notification a security team can get. 
uh, there are a bunch of things that uh, we, we try to deliver. First thing is trying to explain them what we think is wrong. Secondly, we want their input. If uh, this is something that you expected, it's a surprise for you, it's a use case, whatever. So in this case, uh, you click a button and we get a notification. And of course, if this is actually a problem, uh, we provide instruction right away on how to fix that. And if you fix that, we don't get the notification again. So Comet uh, make the assumption that the resource has been fixed. So it's, uh, it's automatic. We don't really need to get involved if you fix it. But if, you, if we get the notification again and again, then everything gets escalated to us and we have to take a look. And of course, depending on the resources, we might want to be involved sooner r rather than later. So also that part is configurable. So something we were super excited about was how quickly we could set up new alert sources for. Um, so now we're going to dive into what's required. If you have a cool scanner and then you want to send the results from that scanner out to engineers. And we have an example. So let's assume you have a company and you have a, an office and there's several floors and you have a couple of toasters on each floor. And each toaster has a configurable default heat level. Um, and you don't want to stop people from having toast six, but you also can't think of a valid use case for toast six. Um, and so you want to warn people and like double check with them that that's the setting they actually want. Um, but you also like you recognize that you shouldn't block people because like they can eat their toast however they want, but also. This seems kind of weird, so you'll tell them. So let's say your company bought smart toasters. And uh, your smart toasters can talk PubSub. So you can configure your toasters to push a message to PubSub. If someone sets the default heat level, uh, in the example, we have to seven or higher. Um, you're only a small security team, so you don't want to be running around the office changing the heat level on the toasters. But your um, identity management team has a database that's kept up to date with the information regarding the toaster owners for each toaster um, that sit on the same floor of the toaster. This is a really good use case for Comet. So let's talk about how we would solve it. Um, first, uh, assume the toasters send a pub sub message that have the attribute source type set to risky toaster to distinguish it from other alert sources that might use PubSub as well. And they send a JSON blob um, that look like this. They have the toaster ID, so you can tell which toaster it is. They have the uh, toaster location floor, so you know what floor it's on. You have the alert type uh, and the comment, which is the problem with the default level set to seven. And then we have a parser. It's a marshmallow schema. And it describes which fields we expect from the incoming messages. Uh, it's exactly the same fields that were listed in the pub sub message before. Uh, so you can see we have a toaster ID, a toaster location floor, an alert type, and a comment. Um, and then we have this last line right here, the app.register parser, which is a comment app instance um, assigned to the variable app that we call register parse the that we call its register parser method to register the schema as a parser for this particular source type. Um, then we have the hydrator to um, enrich or hydrate the incoming messages. Uh, here we have the database for who is responsible for toasters on each floor. And um, that's who we call the uh, find toaster owner function. Um, and we assume that's an API that uh, returns correctly the toaster runner. And then next we look up um, the, oh wait, sorry. So then we wanna, uh, we wanna hydrate that information uh, with the owner information, which we just did. Um, and then we register, it or we register a hydrator to our alert source. Um, and we do this by writing a function and decorating it with the register hydrator method of the comment app. That takes a source type that uh, it can handle as an argument. 
Then we call the toaster owner API to assign an owner to an incoming event. And we populate a couple of metadata fields that can be used by output plugins or for generating metrics. Uh, here we want to aggregate the number of alerts per an resource or an organizational unit. Um, yeah, so that's this part. And then the last thing we need is the router. So we need to make sure that risky to toaster alerts are routed through the right channels to the toaster owner. Uh, and a router is evoked every time there's a new alert for an alert source that needs to be sent out. The router gets a list of events that are already grouped per an owner, and they're labeled as new or old, um, depending on what the field is set to. And whitelisted and snoozed alerts are already filtered out. So here we have an emailer output uh, that plugins can send emails to. And then we can deliver that to owners. And so that's it. Um, it's pretty easy to write. So with this, we can read about a cool new scanner on Hacker News in the morning, and then by lunchtime, have that scanner sending out alerts to our engineers, which is awesome for experimentation on the security team because, uh, yeah, we can set, get scanners up and running really quickly. Um, it usually takes us like less than an hour to get them running. Um, which is something that we didn't think of when we started building this. We uh, hadn't. We kind of want to get rid of baseline, but we didn't consider that uh, this would actually help us innovate faster. So, um, Comet is now like uh, our central. Uh, central pillar of our security infrastructure and is in this privileged position between all our security controls and our customers as the developers. Because of that, we started the leveraging the platform to extract metrics and try to make sense of all the data we were collecting. Because our ambition is actually to drive security efforts in the company based on hard facts. And uh, this is the best place to get some insights. Um, for example, it can be leveraged to, to understand how effective our security controls are, uh, where in the company we see more alerts and where we don't see any, uh, and how do response rates change. Uh, like This team is very responsive. We see a time to fix uh, very short. Uh, the other team is actually takes a bit more of time to fix in their stuff. So we can can of understand like where we might want to focus our education effort and whatnot. This is a, a completely random graph, but just to give you an idea, like the first thing we noticed was actually after we we started splitting all the alerts by owners, uh, you can see like our internal organization there is application security, uh, I don't know iOS, Android, and this is like just the volume of alerts we see. And we can totally see that there are some tribes, uh, some, we call them tribes, but some, some organization that are, gets a low amount of alerts, some they are getting more, and sometimes we see spikes and whatnot. And this started, started uh, like uh, puzzling us, like what's going on, what, what are we missing? We didn't add anything new in particular, we just see a movement in the amount of things we see. So something must change in, uh, in the organization of our customers. And this is uh, an opportunity for us to learn more. Um, this whole part to try to understand the metric is still experimental. Uh, we are playing with it, so we don't really have any insight to give, but we can just show you a bit of what we're done and what we're learning. And because the tool is open source, I mean, we, we really hope to like get other people involved. So if you have ideas, we, we really would like to, to hear them. So the first thing is, of course, metrics for security engineering, uh, and specifically for the teams that are handling specific security controls. Is this scanner effective? Is this scanner noisy? Uh, what kind of acknowledgement am I seeing on the alerts I'm sending through this? Uh, are we scanning the right thing? Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if we don't get uh, any acknowledgement at all, or if we get an acknowledgement that is always like, this is a false positive, then maybe, the scanner is badly configured and we are not focusing on the right stuff. So, so we can get that 
that information before even talking to them, to our customers. We can get that insight. Then there is metrics for security education. Uh, which part of the company gets more alerts? So if you're getting, we, we install a new, a new scanner and we see that uh, the web uh, teams are getting uh, tons of alerts on stuff, or I don't know, XSS everywhere, SQLI, whatever, then maybe we have a problem there. Then maybe uh, we should drive a focused security education program. Uh, or maybe we can just embed with them and try to understand better what's going on and try to uh, uh, come up with some initiatives. And then on the other part is always A-B test all the alerts. Maybe we are not clear enough. Maybe we are not delivering uh, an insight message to them so they don't understand what we are trying to, what, which point we are trying to make. Uh, because security, of course, is not straightforward, especially if you don't do that uh, every day. I mean, not even then, but... And finally, we do have uh, metrics for leadership. Uh, with leadership, I, I mean management and higher ups. So we do have a, a threat modeling team in Spotify. Uh, they do, they are in charge of making an holistic threat model of all the resources and assets the company operates. And usually the process is the threat model is uh, updated quarterly and is done by, um, by, by asking other organization about the problems they have and whatnot, and mixing them with the thing we believe are important and we've seen. So we build this threat model, we update quarterly, and we use them. We use it to drive uh, uh, security work streams outside, so we can actually have the power to make them prioritize security work for us. Now what happens with Comet, instead of falling back in this quarterly update, we can actually continuously update our threat model with the things we see. So th this has shortened a bit the feedback loop for the threat modeling team. In, in the, it's way, the, the threat model now is more alive, kinda, can change a bit, can change running, and it's pretty amazing because you can see where you need, wh where are the fires. So, of course, we, we are starting with this, uh, but we see the potential. And finally, there is this thing uh, that uh, it's so easy to sell to other organizations, uh, the concept that security must be prioritized, if you show them a graph and you tell them, this is how badly you are doing right now, compare to your colleague in the other org. If you show them to leadership, they are like, I don't know if we are triggering gamification or something, but we do have sometimes uh, open all ends where we invite other customers and we can totally see that it's way easier to make them prioritize security work we want to see. So there are, there are, there are lots, of, uh, uh, lots of potential. And of course, there are also lots of red herrings. Uh, I mean, uh, we, don't, we are not a data analyst, data scientist. So what we get is a ton of data. And we are probably amateurs. We are trying to understand everything we see. Uh, I really hope we are going to get some data analysts because. And um, so, so the things we need to always keep in mind is uh, the security controls we deploy are our eyes, so there is another part of the problem that we are not seeing. And of course, we can't rely totally on what we get from the metrics. We need to be mindful of the things we are not scanning for, the use cases we don't know yet, and so on. Um, secondly, it's uh, what happens if uh, teams get no alert? Are they doing great? Well, maybe, or maybe we are just totally clueless on what they do. We, we we, we see the resources they operate, but the use cases are probably unknown to us and we need to investigate. And then there is also, there is this military history that uh, when they introduce uh, helmets, they saw the, 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 the number of head injuries going up. Was that a problem? But uh, maybe, but actually the thing is, was the casualty rate was going down. So, so maybe if we see uh, an organization with an, an unusual spike of alerts, uh, it's not bad. It doesn't mean they are just suddenly careless about how they operate the system. Maybe, maybe they are just growing. Maybe they need, uh, they need some help in onboarding new engineers and stuff, true. But on the other end, 
uh, there is always two sides of every story, so we need to be really mindful of what kind of assumption we do looking at the data. And of course, uh, is the data enough? It's never enough, more data. Uh, we, 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 we are experimenting uh, in collecting more information. We are experimenting with the type of acknowledgement we want for the team, from the teams. Uh, we are experimenting with different type of notification. We want to see how people react to, uh, to, to, to the event to get, uh, of getting a security notification from us. So this is an ongoing effort. As I said, the Comet is now open source. If you think you share some part of the problem with us, please take a look. Maybe you can come up with some better ideas than we have. Uh, we, we totally love to work together on this. So um, now let's dive into the conclusion. Let's like look at the total flow of what happens um, with Comet. Uh, when any of our scanners alert people, uh, the people get an email. Um, the teams own their own alerts, so they can decide whether to um, you say accepted business risk, or fix them, or not respond. If they don't act in a certain amount of time, the, it gets escalated. And the teams that set up the scanner can decide how it gets escalated. So the incident response teams, for example, will usually send an alert to Slack, and they might have an escalation time of 30 minutes before something um, gets escalated to them. Whereas the infrastructure security team will usually give teams about a week to fix their uh, misconfigurations in the cloud, depending on what they are. Um, then leadership gets metrics on which parts of the org we're fixing and how much of the stuff our tools are fixing. And we get metrics on how effective our alerts are and uh, what type of change we're driving in the org based on the alerts. What else did we gain? Well, Comet was started basically when the engineers and the team uh, got together and decided we had much too much baseline and went to our project owner and said, we need to make a change to this, and here's an idea for the system, and can we spend some time building it? Um, and we thought we were going to gain a reduction baseline, which we did, but we also gained a lot more. Um, so we don't have to chase people down from scanner results anymore. So we have more time to do the security engineering stuff we're super excited about. We have an organized and clear way of dealing with scanner results. Um, no more hacking together solutions every time. Uh, it's nice code, it's well tested, it doesn't randomly break, it's pretty sweet to manage and to own. Um, we have a feedback loop on how effective our alerts are, so we can understand which alerts are working, which alerts aren't working, um, and why they aren't working. We can understand what engineers are learning from us and uh, what they're not understanding. And we can make it really clear for normal under engineers to understand the problems. Um, Lastly, we've increased experimentation for the security team. Uh, we can now write and implement scanners with very little friction. Um, that being said, we understand that email filters will be the death of Comet. So we work super hard to not spam our users. Um, but that's why we built in all the nice, nice features, like batching together the alerts and, uh, so that you know, the users feel like the alerts are useful. And that's why we let the users own all of their alerts, so the users can say they're snoozing stuff or that this is accepted. Um, and that's it. Um, check it out on github.com slash Spotify. You can follow either of us on Twitter. Um, yeah, give us feedback, start it. Um, if you want to use this in your org, feel free to reach out. Uh, we're really excited to work with other people on it. Uh, so yeah. Uh, thank you.
student Booty. men to bash it over the microphone. There we go. All right. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about was in terms. So now that you've distributed alerts to the teams, it's clear that you're pushing a lot more of the responsibility on the team. One of the things I noticed, and one of the things that's challenged for my organization, is risk acceptance. So if somebody clicks through risk acceptance, how do you go back and ensure that there's a responsibility uh, taken up for that? And how do you ensure that they're not just uh, dealing with alert fatigue, and so they're like, well, you know, we'll deal with this. So uh, just to close out the risk acceptance piece, one of the things about it is, ultimately, I think you still have to deal with that as a security team. So if they say, yeah, sure, it's fine, how do you ensure that six months from now, you go back and it's like, is that still fine or not? Yeah. Um, me or you? You can go. I think we both. I think we both have feelings about this. This is something our team has talked about for. We've had so many meetings about this. Whether we should include that button of the accepted risk. That was. <laughs> yeah. But I guess the bottom line is, um, I mean, it's not like we don't look at the data. Uh, we want to know if they are knowledge. We want to know why. So if we see that a team is always like ah, this is business value or like uh, accepted risk then eventually we go to them and like, uh, yeah, tell me about your risk appetite. Uh, what's your threat model or whatnot? Right. So I, I and I, the, what I'm getting at in particular is just in the case of the distributed responsibility, sometimes they'll say, yeah, we accept it. Yeah. But later on, maybe that acceptance doesn't hold anymore. Maybe the conditions have changed. And it would be really yeah. interesting to see how you guys. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's a process. I mean, it's a. Talking about alerts with teams is not the only interaction we have. Uh, we do have incidents, for example. And that's a great uh, uh, moment to understand if the risk appetite was way off. <laughs> um, but so, yeah. And on top of that, the threat modeling risk is actually making sure that all the, org, uh, all, all the orgs in the company are on track. So on a maybe a higher level than the teams, we do have some understanding of what are the real problems that needs to be addressed first. And we also have the, the metrics that tell us um, which, why people are pressing the buttons and then which parts of the org are pressing which buttons. So we can notice if, say, like we have a certain department that seems to be hitting those buttons a lot. But it'd actually be interesting to build in like a repeat sort of alert sending. Like, yeah, you accepted this a while ago. Maybe, are you sure about that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> More questions? Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, you mentioned uh, the two sources, which are Detectify and Forseti. Um, are you able to name other sources that you are checking? I can uh, name something like uh, if you're using Java, which is dependency check or um, um, yeah, other tools who are checking the source code. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, we have a few. Um, uh, we do have a dependency scanner. It's uh, included in our build pipelines. Uh, I think it's custom made, and we use that to deliver alerts when, like, uh, an application is built with a with a um, deprecated de dependency and whatnot. And then we do have. Uh, patch monitoring in place that scans the fleet of servers, for example, wherever there is something needs to be patched, goes through Comet and reach the owner of the machine. Then we do have, um, I'm trying to think specifically of our team. Um, we, have, we, have, we have a few actually. Uh, but uh, we operate just for SETI, for example, and the cloud scanners for other uh, for other uh, cloud uh, providers. But other teams, the incident response teams, for example, they use, uh, they have a system, they, they query or query, and they collect some data, and from them, they set up some alerts. And we do have Splunk, as I said, so most of the logs we ingest, we, we use that to feed, to comment for alerts. So it's, um, it's widely used internally. Uh, but we only release uh, for SETI and Detectify because those are public and are, we have a, a public relationship with Google and with Detectify, so. Um, thank you. 
um, I have another question, which is uh, um, regarding uh, the, uh, the the other one who asked question. Um, do you distinct between responsibility and accountability regarding security in our teams? So that's something like uh, the squad or the tribe is responsible for the security, but another person is accountable for the security of their services? No, I would say we don't distinguish. Um, yeah. So just to, as you're responsible for the infrastructure and the backends, do we have similar systems in place for the workstations of all the employees, the developers and marketing people and so forth? Uh, we do have some system for endpoint security and that's on our incident response team. Um, well, that's the always query part and that what you meant? They own the, uh, I'm, I think yes, um, but also we have some, some other stuff that is managing the fleet of uh, laptops and uh, workstations that we use to query and set alerts from. Okay, thanks. More questions? Oh. Thank you. Thanks.